Hey, welcome to the shop. We are uh, going to talk a little bit about tools tonight and looking at my tool cabinet. But it took me a while, you know, to decide how do you want to lay out your tool cabinet. And I actually made a big cardboard mock-up with, you know, the, the dimension. And then I had the two wings. Because almost like a kitchen, you know, if you're designing a kitchen, like I, I did years ago for our house, you want to put all the things so they're really convenient and plan out your drawers and places for everything. And um, so I did that on the cardboard before I got too committed to doing this. Um, and uh, anyway, I decided to put my marking tools on the right side because I'm usually marking and cutting dovetails down this end of the bench. And then the planes had to go in the center section because they just needed more depth like that. And the saws seemed good up high. And uh, just miscellaneous things that I don't use as much over here. Um, anyway, this is, you have to decide like when you're, if you build your own cabinet, you know, do you want it to be super functional? Like do you want to be able to uh, grab your tools and go? Or do you want to chock full it, fill it up with everything you have? Like you've seen some cabinets, I love looking at them because they're loaded with all kinds of tools. But I also keep other tools and things in these drawers. But in the cabinet, I wanted the things that I seem to use all the time. And I didn't want to put them in such a way that I had to like turn a little hook or something to take them out. But I wanted everything to be grab and go and easy to put back again. So there's not like, it would encourage me to put things back. Because that's, that's a little thing too. Um, you know, your whole bench gets full of tools and, and it just, it feels good at the end of the day. Now I do pretty well at putting things away because it, it gives you that completed feeling. So anyway, that's how that's going. But, um, <laughs> But I wanted to just give you an overview of some of the tools. And um, I'm, I'll go deep into the tuning up and use of various tools in future weeks. But um, just to say, you know, what I basically put in here are those that are my favorites that I use a lot. Like I have quite a few planes. Um, one of my, my favorite sentimental one is the one that belonged to my grandfather, which I keep on top. It's a number seven Stanley. That's just too long to fit in the cabinet too, but I like the way it, it's like a crowning piece on top of the cabinet. I've got the, rather, the other planes that I chose to put into the cabinet are the ones that I use a lot. Like I probably use this number five the most. It's just a really nice mid-range plane so that it's not like a number four is so much shorter. Like here's a typical number four. And it's quite the jump from the four up to the five. This is good to get into smaller spaces, but um, and for smaller things, it's almost like halfway to a block plane when you use one of these. I've got a little issue with this one. And it's not actually functional, so I'm going to bring it with me next time I'm heading to like an antique tool dealer um, to get get that thing working well again. I think I need a blade too. But other than that, these others are ready to go. This is a low angle jack, the number 62 by Lee Nielsen. Really sweet plane. I've got my my low angle for. Um, crazy grain or in grain or shooting. And then this is the um, miter plane. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I never remember, but This'll, this I use a lot with a shooting board. Um, it's basically a massive block plane that it has a blade that's over an eighth of an inch thick. But it comes in at a low angle. It's very boxy. So this actually is a very cool plane and it does amazing work like uh, when you just want to shear some end grain or make some miters using it with a shooting board. And then 
this Lee Nelson smoother. I've got, um, I got this one. This, by the way, this is just an awesome plane. Sorry, I keep moving around, right? It's a, a four and a half. It's just got this wide mouth. I usually keep this dialed in for a very light shaving. So after I'm done planing the surface, I think we did this last, last time, maybe a couple of times ago. And, uh, but I'll, sh I'll show you more about this future episodes because this is such a sweet tool and I just leave it so it's ready to take a very thin shaving and it gives you like this polished finished shaving so it's not made for the aggressive cut but it's got weight so it just stays down and it'll just take the lightest most polished shaving I've got a low angle Lee Nielsen block plane 60 and one half I just love this block plane you know it's it's for small work you know you create little chamfers on the ends of things and um, but the way this brass knob here like fits in your palm and you hold it in these little indentations on the side and then your index finger goes into that little cap it's just like an extension of your hand but you can do a incredible detailed work with this and it's just a sweet sweet tool so if I was going to get one block plane, I'd grab that one. But I happen to have two of them. <laughs> I keep one of them a little um, more aggressive. And I keep this old Stanley. Yeah. I just, this is not obviously a fine tool, but I keep it even heavier for like aggressive cuts. And I've got this little, uh, shoulder plane number 92 and I've got this router plane these are cool I have not even I barely used this it was a gift <laughs> another gift from a neighbor after he moved I helped him and uh, he was kind enough to send me that uh, anyway I've also got um, for for beveled edge cutting tools um, these spoke shaves which I like a lot I've got one here with a Stanley. Um, this one has, this is the number 51. There's no adjustment knobs on this one. I would just adjust it by hand by unscrewing this, loosening it, and then advancing the blade. And I would sight it, usually against a light wall, so I could see how the blade's extending there. And then after I got this one, the number 151, with the the knobs that are set into a groove here, you can actually control the adjustment much easier and uh, just adjust and lock it in that way. So I, this is pretty much my most frequently used spoke shave. Occasionally I'll use this one, which has the rounded, um, the rounded sole to go into concave tight corners. Um, I've used that a few times recently. And then this straight one. I say this is my starting lineup, but I just like spoke shaves. And I've got this number 52. And so these were in the series. This has straight wings. I'm sure somebody could tell me why, you know, what's the big difference or deal? What? Why did one have straight? I guess this is to get up off of a surface a little more. This would be probably more if you were just doing rounded actual spoke type work or um, edges of something. And then I've got the Stanley number 80 scraper that hasn't gotten a lot of um, use, but I've messed around with it some. My preferred method, most times I'm not doing large tops and things. Um, so I just use these card scrapers here and I try to keep a deck of them in like that. Like initially, oh good, it still comes out. This block here, this used to be on my bench top in North Carolina. I had it like this. And I had, see that little edge? This is what I did when I was, when I wanted to make a little fixture for the shop and not make a tool cabinet. 
I made this little stand and it had a little wing that came up over here too so they would stay in there. But I would just have all these card scrapers in a row. And I've got different types. This is a real thin one for light kind of detail work. This is more your classic standard one. I just got that from um, Lee Valley. They were down at Fine Woodworking Live and they were kind enough to let me have that one. And you know, I really, most of my card scrapers are Sandvik which is a good card scraper. I got nothing against them. But this one, I don't know, it just feels, it feels like it has a little more body to it. And it's not, it's not like it's a lot thicker or anything. It just feels like a, a little better quality. And, it, and it's taken a beautiful shaving. Here's another, this is a Sandvik that was like that wide, but just from scraping, from sharpening, Little by little, they get worn off, and uh, that's what we get there. And then this one does a little detail work. I don't know why I keep this. I hardly ever use it, and it just caused me to curse too many times when I, I tried using this going around like beads, and invariably that point would dig into something and mess you up. But what I do use a lot is this French Curve card scraper, to scrape out any kind of cove, you can always find the radius just by rotating it and angling it. I can always get a hook so you can actually turn a burr on this edge and get a beautiful shaving on a cove of a molding. What's that? Okay. You can get a beautiful shaving using um, any point on this. So, uh, and then I've got this, this is a homemade from a, from a saw blade. But anyway, I cut my little card scraper. I didn't want to give up my history with this. This is made out of mahogany, by the way. <laughs> and I cut it so it would fit right in my cabinet here. And I can just slide them right into the slots. And I still have my old friend. So I'm going to put those back in there. All right, so... Um, I've got my chisels right over here down on the low side. And these have changed out quite a bit. I did have the whole set of these Swiss made. I had six of them, and that's actually how these were made to fit. But then um, Veritas, or Lee Valley, uh, sent along some of these PMV11s. It's, a, it's like a steel alloy. It's a and it holds an edge so beautifully that I decided I would give these guys the starting position for a little while. <laughs> but I only had five, so I didn't have the one that was like five-eighths wide. So I still got my old Swiss made in there. So I'm giving these a try for a while. And um, so this is like the fourth, fourth chisel set that I've had. I had these. I've got some old ones that in the drawer still that I really like that were this, this style. This might be my favorite, how they fit in your hand. I actually, I can't remember the name on these. I got these in the early 90s. But um, they were sweet, rosewood handles. So they just don't have the prime position anymore. And then I've got marking tools up here. Um, I always want to say star it, stir it, stir it, even though it's spelled. St is it spelled star it? No, it's spelled star it, but everyone says stir it, I think. <laughs> so if you want to be cool, say stir it. But um, I think I got that right. Somebody correct me if I don't. All right, anyway, this is a sweet combination square. If you're going to get a combination square, it's got to be good. You got to know when you're square. So you got to get a good one. Uh, don't cheap out on this. Um, I, I bought cheap for a lot of my starter tools, but it's really not whether with a square. It's just like a level to a carpenter. You have to know if the building's level that you're building. You have to know the thing is square so often. So get one you can trust, even though it costs a few bucks. It always, 
or more than a few, <laughs> it always feels good when you have a really precision tool. And then I got this little guy that um, is really sweet. It's only a four inch um, square, but it it does a great job. And for so many so many small like dovetail operations or setting tools or marking, you don't really want a big square. And that, that has been really nice. I've enjoyed that one. And then I have a couple marking knives here. This is my Japanese marking knife that I used to mark out dovetails primarily. And we just did that last night. And then this was a later edition. I only added this about probably eight years ago. Um, but this is uh, an actual scalpel. And I love having this because it it has, it really does have a beautiful edge. And of course you can replace the knives just like a, a surgeon. And it makes you feel like a surgeon when you use it. Um, but it's, uh, it's got such a sweet edge. It's great for cutting and trimming veneer or mitering like where you're overlapping. Because it's such a fine edge. Um, I got this at CS letter C and S, and then artsandcrafts.com, I believe. They have all this kind of stuff. And this is the Swan Morton. This is the, this one I like the most. They, some of them are plastic, but this one, this has like got some weight to it. So it feels really good in your hand. I'm not, I don't think they have many, um, if you want to get one, that's, that's a nice one to get. And that blade that I ended up choosing, they have a whole assortment of blade shapes. But I like the 10A, the capital letter A. 10A is this one. It's really kind of rigid, but it, it's got a steep enough angle. You can do some fine, fine detail work with that. And they don't, they realize there was a whole market in the craft world outside of, you know, the medical profession, so they aren't sterilized like all, they all have to be for the medical world, but they're awesome. This, you find so many uses for that. And then I have a marking gauge here, and this actually is not the marking gauge that I use all the time. It was the one I used all the time before, but I like it so much. Um, it's rosewood. It's got the worn edges of age, brass inlays. Look at it. It's so sweet. It just, it's a wonderful tool when you think of where that's been. And I just like to have some old tools in the cabinet, but I end up using this one in the drawer a lot more. I got a bunch of these for the classes, and these, are, these have an actual knife in here. This one had a pin, which I ground to a knife. But, um, so I end up using these the most. And then I have this all which is handy for many occurrences. And a, um, um, a paring chisel. I only need one of these because uh, these are very flexible and they're long. This is a sorby. And if I'm going to pair something on a surface, what's great is, like I got that gunk on my little table there, you can lift up the handle and because it's so flexible, what's at the end is laying dead flat on the surface. And you can just shear without cutting into the surface because it's just forcing the chisel to be flat on the table. And you can pair flush and get the gunk off your bench. <laughs> or actually, you can pair like any kind of uh, peg or shear anything flush with that bad boy. And that has its own little spot with a magnet behind here. And I should have said, these all have magnets behind them as well. These seem to get an edge as good as like high carbon steel. And they hold the edge really well. So I'm pretty happy with it. Then I have this bevel gauge up here. This I want to replace pretty soon. Um, I have my eye on this, these bevel gauges that this guy makes. I think he's in Texas. No, I think he's out of the country, actually, because I met him at the Lee Nielsen event last summer, and 
They are so nice. I mean, they were costly. I couldn't break down for one right then, but someday. Because this is nice, but I don't trust it completely. I actually ground it, and I don't see it in plain. So I actually, a lot of times, I'll use this old Freud, and it's not as, you know, it's got the rust on there, but this, I know, is pretty accurate, so I use that a lot. But um, I forget what those tools were called that this guy made, but they were so nice. So I do, you do a lot of bevel work with, with chairs especially, and um, that's one of my favorite tools to use because you can simplify compound joinery with a good bevel gauge. And that, so I have this one, have this mini one in the drawer. So these are the more things I don't use quite as often. Then I have a couple rules tucked in here. I've got a one foot and then a two foot Bridge City. This is super flexible. So this, this actually helps to mark out things a lot that are curved. And it's really accurate. It's got all the um, metric on the other side. So when I try to remember how many millimeters are in an inch, I can always refer to this. And it's right around 25. <laughs> I finally learned that. <laughs> but I had a 6-inch one, which somehow didn't get back in here. I used to have three or four of them. So i got to pick up some more of those to uh, keep me going here. Then I got this little brush, which was a gift. Um, to the presenters at Fine, Wood Fine Woodworking Live last year. And I didn't think I was going to use it that much. But I've used this thing a lot. It's really soft, and it's great for dusting off your tools and cleaning off your bench. I guess you could do yourself, too. But uh, it's just right for cleaning things off. So I'm actually turning over a new leaf and keeping things clean. So I keep that right there. And before I do any class, like at night, I'll usually be brushing off my bench with that very brush. And um, then just continuing more across the cubbies, I've got a couple veneer tools here, my veneer saw and the roller and the sharpening block for that, and various knives in here. Here's a little carving knife, the kind that would make that little guy up there. And, um, and the specialty, I made this. This is a marking knife to go deep or very thin if you're doing very decorative dovetails. I, had, I didn't have something that was fine enough that would mark, because when you're doing decorative, they tend to be very thin, and you need something precise to get in there. So I ground it here, and I ground it here, so I have a right and a left hand ground, so it's flat on one side. And um, then I got a couple other knives just in here. Buck, and then this this is a pretty cool. Bessie has uh, made this really high-end um, utility knife, but it's really sweet. It's got a lot of weight to it. It's wood inlaid, really nice. I like using that too. Then it's a few hand tool hand saws. I mean, up here I've got a Japanese saw, the Zuki saw. It's kind of like it's small, but it's good to for trim or cutting things off quickly. Um, my Lee Nielsen dovetail saw, which is a 15 teeth per inch rip cut. And then uh, the Lee Nielsen uh, 14 teeth cross cut. And I've got this little coping saw over here hanging on the side, kind of hiding out right there. Um, this space is deep enough where you could make an accessory door to swing out and put tools on both sides. but I don't know. I just, I just like everything being grab it and go. If I need, if I get to a point where I want more in there, I, I would probably do that and have a little pivoting door. And then a rubber mallet here and my, my regular like carving mallet here and some wax and erasers, which you can't get enough of when you're drawing. And then I just have some old screws. This this side of the cabinet is not as well worked out. This is like room to grow with some nicer tools, but um, I have this little like compass that I I just it's very fancy. I use some masking tape and put a pen on there 
I believe it's a high quality BIC ballpoint. And, uh, <laughs> but when you want to scribe a circle quickly, and some calipers, these are just, I almost never use these, but I just like the look of them. They're, they're old. These are good on the turning. They don't have a little, not to tighten, but they're pretty firm, so they hold the space. So anytime you want to measure the diameter of something there, it's right there. And I like the look of it right there. My little hammer, this has gone, seen a lot of miles. But uh, this has been a wonderful little hammer. And uh, I just use that a lot. And my Nicholson rasps. Most of my files in rasps I have in here too. I have some backups and some burnt out ones. But anyway, that uh, I love the way these cut. They're really sweet and superior. So that's for the cabinet. There's, of course, a lot of clamps and a lot of other hand tools around. And there's a lot of stuff in the drawers. But I wanted mainly to show you what was in the cabinet. So thanks for spending some time with me tonight in the shop. I hope to see you next week.